Good evening, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome on behalf of the Jamaica Accountability Meetup Portal, of which I'm the Executive Director, the National Integrity Action, and the Institute of Law and Economics. May I welcome you all to the second in our series of reasoning on matters of accountability, democracy, public policy, all of my favorite subjects, yes? <laughs> and I'm certain that it is also yours because not many persons, unless you're passionate about these things and the country and our future, um, would be willing to give up one hour of their post Sunday dinner, what do I call it, nap time, family time, to spend with us discussing matters like this. But we really had a wonderful time about two weeks ago when we rolled this out and based on the response, we felt that it would be good to develop a series. So we're very happy to have you here. I think the last time we looked at parliamentary committees, most of you would know that that would be seated in the context of our prime minister making a decision a couple of weeks ago to, I would say, shift up the parliamentary policy to allow for the chairman of these committees to be now chaired by government members as opposed to the opposition. And that stirred up a lot of discussion in Jamaica, which ended up stirring up a lot of discussion here in the context of oversight and monitoring and the state of our roads and the spending of COVID. And it was such a wonderful evening that we decided that we would do it again. So here we are today. We are going to be looking at, drum roll, restoring trust in our democracy. And we're gonna be drawing on both the US experience, the experience of our neighbors in the North and our experience here at home. But I really wanna give a special welcome also to the Jamaicans who are healing from pretty far off around the globe. Some of them are here, I think are about six, seven, eight hours. So they're probably already into the morning hours. We really do appreciate your being here and investing this time with us. And for the discussion, I mean, I know how you feel I've been there. When you're, when you're so far away from home, sometimes you're only there in body, but your spirit and your clock is still set here on Jamaica time. So we know you're very cognizant of what's happening here, but we also wanna ask you to share with us what's happening because I think this subject about restoring trust and democracy is something that is relevant for all jurisdictions around the world. Now, the pleasure is mine today of introducing you as we jump right into our two presenters. And um, I'm not quite sure who to credit with the quote that says uh, a mind, uh, no, 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 a mind stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. I think that has been attributed to Einstein, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Holmes, but whoever says it, that is really my hope for this evening, that there is going to be a kind of mingling of minds and thoughts and sharing of views so that your mind will not go back to the original dimensions of where we started at five o'clock. And I don't think that's a lofty ideal because these two presenters are really the kinds of persons where, boy, when I rub up my brain against there's iron sharp iron, you know what I mean? I never leave the conversations with Dr. Professor Trevor Monroe and Professor Rosalie Hamilton with my brain regaining its original dimensions. So I really wanna thank them for being here with us this evening and for the preparation that they have made. And I wanna just say um, before we go much further that we've really designed this to give a little bit more time than we did the first time to engagement with those who have chosen to be with us this evening. So we imagine that in about 20 minutes, 25 minutes tops, we will shift from the presentations to ask you to join us with your thoughts. Now, most of you would have already received the articles that both Rosalia and Trevor has written so that we can really just jump right into the meat of the matters today. However, I know a lot of people are tempted to introduce these two Jamaicans by saying, boy, you know, do they really need an introduction? But I am really going to ask for your patience today while I give them a proper introduction. I'm gonna resist that temptation because there are persons from across the Caribbean and some who might not be as familiar. And to be very honest with you, when I read the profile of both Rosalie and Trevor today, I learned some things I actually, I hadn't known before. So I really wanna take the time to introduce them because sometimes in the Q&A, if you know of the depth of the experience of the presenters, it does shift a little bit what you choose to ask them. And so I must say in introducing them, when I dipped my toes gingerly into advocacy back in about 2013, these were two of the persons in the room who left a, a lot of, ad, um, um, I would say residue, which explains a lot of why I do what I do today. 
Rosalia um, is probably not expecting me to tell the story, but I should have put a disclaimer on those articles before we sent them out because Rosie did an article back in 2013 that when I read it, it caused me, and this is the truth, to get up the morning, go to hot off the press, buy a t-shirt, put my views on the front and the back, and I walked in Ligony, New Kingston, and Halfway Tree, sharing with other citizens and engaging them on the issue of the day. So you have to be very careful when you let these two in the room because you never know what you're gonna be doing tomorrow morning, but whatever it is, I sincerely hope it's gonna be more engagement in the governance of Jamaica. Now, without any ado, much more ado, I wanna really welcome Professor Monroe and Professor Hamilton. Dr. Trevor Monroe is currently the executive director of the National Integrity Action and also a member of Jamaica's chapter of Transparency International. He has authored and co-authored at least nine books and has received many awards and scholarships, not the least of which is the Rhodes Scholarship and an Oxford PhD in political science. He has been a civil society advocate for the longest time. Professor Monroe was instrumental as a founder and a co-founder of CAFE. That's the Citizens Action for Free and Fair Elections, as well as the University and Allied Workers Union. And the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition of which that was when I dipped my toes in advocacy and was also a member of, of, of that wonderful group. Um, in public service, Professor Monroe has served as an independent senator for 10 years. He has served on the executive of the Confederation of Trade Unions and the private sector's think tank in the 1990s. Now he has served as a consultant to several development agencies, USAID, DFID, UNDP, UNESCO, the OAS, the Carter Center, He's currently a member of the Partnership for Jamaica Council, and he has ser served on several different advisory boards for the government. And in 2015, I'm proud to say that Trevor was recognized for all of this work with the national honors as he was awarded the Order of Distinction of Commander Class. So I'm gonna invite Professor Monroe to share with us now his thoughts. And in about 15 minutes, I will do an introduction to Professor Hamilton, where she will give us a summary of some of the articles and the things that she has been sharing over the last two weeks on the subject of our democracy and trust. So I'm gonna hand over now to none other than our friend and our advocate, Professor Trevor Monroe. Thank you very much, Jeanette. I really appreciate your Introduction, even though I don't appreciate that it took away some of my time. <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> I am to speak as I welcome each and every one of you to the issue of restoring trust in democracy, drawing on the US and the American, the Jamaican experiences. Let me first of all say that the shortfall in trust is acknowledged and spoken about by the highest levels of political leadership in Jamaica for many years. And in terms of the global situation, has been found by every scientific survey of which I'm familiar, the declining trust in democracy and in governance. I therefore begin with a very important remark made by Prime Minister Holness at the time of his inauguration in March of 2016, I believe it was March 7th. Prime Minister Holness said, and here I quote, there is no doubt that significant numbers of Jamaicans have lost hope in our system. Jamaican people want to see action in building trust, end of quote. Then in 2020, on September the 7th, after the lowest electoral voter turnout in our entire history, the Prime Minister again said, and here I quote, in his inaugural speech, we must seek to prevent the occurrence of actions which weaken public trust and damage the integrity of the government." End of quote. That issue of trust and declining levels of trust in democracy in Jamaica and elsewhere has also been found by numerous surveys and polls by Don Anderson, Bill Johnson and others. But it's not confined to Jamaica. The Pew Research Center in the United States has found declining levels of trust in their government from over 70% in the late 1950s to 20% or thereafter in 2015. In the different institutions of the federal government, the presidency similar declines, 
in relation to the Congress equally, and the press as well, declines in trust in the United States. Interrelated with this global decline in trust in democracy is a erosion of political rights and liberties, which Freedom House, which is the, one of the main or major international bodies that track political rights and civil liberties across the world. Freedom House in their most recent study, 2020, developed a chart, which I'll ask that to put on the screen, I believe it's there, uh, where for the last 14 years, the countries that have seen declines in democracy, in political rights and civil liberties, have outnumbered those which have improved. So that in 2019, for example, 64 countries, including the United States, substantial declines in the acknowledgement and recognition of political rights and civil liberties, 37 countries saw an improvement. And that is an indication not only of a decline in trust, but a declining acknowledgement within the systems of people's rights and liberties. Those declining levels of trust and acknowledgement of political rights and civil liberties have been accompanied by an erosion of levels of satisfaction with the performance of democracy. And this, I suppose, I would suggest is one of the greatest concerns that we all should have. The Cambridge University study, for example, found that the levels of dissatisfaction with democracy worldwide, globally, has declined substantially, or rather increased substantially, and correspondingly, the levels of satisfaction have declined. So when you look at that chart, you will see the levels of dissatisfaction, uh, global dissatisfaction coming out of that Cambridge University study, steadily increasing to where it is now about 57.5% across the globe, which means there's a 42.5% level of satisfaction, one of the lowest, in fact, the lowest on record, Cambridge University tells us. When we come to the Latin American region, we see a chart which tells us where Jamaica is in relation to that. That's not the uh, slide I'd like to see, put up the, ah, there you are. When you look at that slide, you will see that Jamaica, in terms of levels of satisfaction with democracy, it's a 32 point. Two percent, and there are only three countries which have lower levels of satisfaction with democracy than Jamaica. One of the reflections of this, and I say only one, is the decline in percentage of voter turnout in every single region of the world. The Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance provides us with that uh, information. The global averages have fallen from a little under 80% in the 1940s to a little over 60% in the 2000s. In the Americas, that has fallen from 70% uh, to a little over 60%. In the Caribbean, which we don't have a chart for, but which I could put up at some point, the Jamaican 2020 numbers, the voter turnout in Jamaica, which we will put up on the screen in a moment, because you'll see the decline over the years, at 37 point something percent, in fact, is the lowest in the hemisphere with the exception of Haiti. The other side of that coin of distrust in democratic institutions, particularly elections, is accompanying that decline of trust in political parties, in the police, in every other institution that you can imagine in our democratic system. The other side of that coin is perhaps the most worrying of all, in that for the first, not the first time, I think it happened in 2017, the survey, which is done every two years by the Latin American Public Opinion Project, looking at different countries across the hemisphere, found that Jamaica, the Jamaican people, scored the highest 65% prepared to turn to military rule, authoritarian uh, rule, in order to deal with crime, and 58% to deal with corruption. That's the very highest in the 
uh, countries surveyed about 18 or 19. So we have a really worrying situation nationally and globally in relation to trust, in relation to levels of acknowledgement and um, application of political rights and civil liberties in relation to degrees of satisfaction with democracy. So the question obviously jumps at us. Why is this so? Why is this happening? Obviously, since it's happening in so many countries, one of the main reasons has to be global, even though they are specific mm -hmm. for each country. Looking at global situation, the best summary I have seen of why this is taking place is done by the Edelman Trust, a very important uh, global research body, the Edelman Trust. And they have a barometer. And in the course of uh, analyzing why it is that democracy is in such trouble, they indicate and I quote, there is a growing sense of inequity and unfairness in the system. Inequity and unfairness, which the people at the base feel strongest. This coincides with a study done in 2014 by the Global Corruption Barometer, where 114,000 persons were surveyed in 107 countries. And they were asked the question, to what extent is government run by a few interests looking out for themselves, a few big interests looking out for themselves. At that point, 54% of that global survey answered to a large extent or entirely. That has now grown in the Edelman study to 57% in 2020. I should mention, by the way, that in the 2014 study, it was 64% of the persons in the United States who felt that way. 60% in the United Kingdom. The only countries that where people felt that the governments were serving the public interest more than a few big private interests was Norway and a couple of the Scandinavian countries where it was 5% who felt the over overwhelming majority believed that government was really serving the public interest. What is the basis of this? The basis of it is quite simple, though not a single factor. There are many factors, but one of the main ones is this. The relative neglect of the majority by widening inequity and inequality. COVID-19 has brought this out more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Income inequality, inequality in education, in healthcare, in the justice system. One particular measure disturbs me and disturbs, should disturb all of us considerably. There's a very important recent uh, index called the Commitment to Reduce Inequality Index. It was developed following the commitment, the global commitment, this uh, sustainable development goal number 10, which tells us that we need to be committed to reducing inequality as an important part of the advance for human development. Jamaica, in that commitment to reduce inequality in 2020, the study just came out, ranks 120 out of 158 countries. 119 countries are doing better than us. And amongst that 119, almost every single Caribbean state that's measured. In fact, we are number 25 out of 26 in the Latin American uh, Caribbean uh, region. So that is the major overarching explanation. Governments not dealing with the levels of inequity, unfairness, which the majority of people feel the democratic systems are not dealing with or facilitating. Obviously then the next question is what is to be done? And the answer to that is fairly simple and we all know it. It is to so transform democratic institutions to make democracy be in fact and not just in theory, government of the people, by the people and for the people. As we all know that acronym. That is a process and not an event. It's a process which requires at least four or five things which I want to mention. One, to enforce and expand democratic rights and freedoms. For example, the right to information, an important democratic right and freedom. The right to ensure that the vote does count more than money in politics. Environmental rights, especially in the context of uh, climate change, and the need for climate justice. We need to ensure and enforce very importantly in our country and our region, equality before the law. The last study done in 20, 
12, 13 in seven Caribbean states found that the majority of people felt that persons who are well connected or who are wealthy would never be convicted before the courts uh, for corruption. We also need to enforce the mechanisms of accountability and transparency. For example, the parliamentary oversight that Rosie wrote those articles relating to, we need to ensure that the protective institutions, the Office of the Public Defender, the Office of the Political Ombudsman, and those institutions which were set up to provide a check and balance against executive elective dictatorship and to facilitate the people that those function more than they ought to or than they are now. So that is the what is to be done. The hardest part is where we conclude. How? Because the what is not hard to see. The how is the difficult when you see year after year this dissatisfying situation developing. I suggest that the single most important how is citizen engagement mm -hmm. and civic activism. To get our citizens engaged and to make them active in defending democratic rights, freedoms, and institutions. That is easier said than done. In order to do that, I had drawn the experience of national integrity action over the nine years or so. The first and most important foundation of that is building public awareness. The people need to be aware the way we did it through documentaries, television ads, forums, town hall meetings, articles such as those which you had seen, which, then, uh, which uh, Rosalie had written, and statements, or most re recent statement on environmental rights in relation to the dry har harbor mining, opened people's eyes. They never knew that they had environmental rights in Jamaica since 2011 with the charter. So that is the first thing, public awareness building. And our experience is that it has had an impact. Needs to be bigger, but the impact is there. The surveys tell us that bribery, bribery victimization, namely the number of people willing on, uh, to pay and take bribes has declined significantly over the last uh, few years in, the, in relation to the public awareness building. The tolerance of bribery has gone down. And of course, much legislation has been passed to strengthen good governance, not least of all campaign finance reform. So that's the first thing, building the awareness of the public. Very, very expensive, very, very, uh, needs a lot of funds, but we can't avoid doing it. Secondly, awareness re requires assertiveness. People can know, but keep quiet. Assertiveness means that we make into real life the pledge that we say, I promise to stand up for justice, peace, and brotherhood. Indeed, the last survey in 2019 found that 59, 59% of Jamaican people said they were willing and ready to get involved in the combat of corruption and in the strengthening of good governance. Our experience tells us that the limited standing up produces meaningful though limited results. The dismissal of ministers who have been found engaged in impropriety, Minister Zan under the previous administra administration, Minister Wheatley under the last one, Minister Reid. Mm -hmm. We have seen where when the people stand up, limited as it sometimes is, the government is forced to reverse policies that are not in their favor. I think of 2014, Minister Phillips had to reverse the policy to put a withdrawal uh, tax on bank withdrawals. And more recently, in 2018-19, uh, the government had to withdraw the proposal to sequester cabinet documents for not just 20 years, but 70 years as a result of public uh, protest and outcry. So that's the second thing, building public assertiveness. The third thing is capacity building. That is to say, building the professionalism and integrity amongst public bodies, the training that we have done with investigators, with prosecutors, with court staff, including sensitization of judges, we believe is beginning to have an impact and it's important to keep building our capacity. Capacity building among our civil society organizations, the Council for Voluntary Social Services, for example, we have, we have trained integrity champions in most of the uh, communities across the country. Youth violence prevention, building the capacity of the young people in the communities to stand up for what is right and to be honest. And of course, not least of all, the, uh, defending the rights of women as well as of disadvantaged communities. Very much finally, the awareness building, the public assertiveness, 
the capacity building needs to be framed in the context of partnerships. Partnerships among civil society organizations, such as we had in 2010, which diminished because of the absence, the lack of funds. Partnerships with the private sector, with the church. Again, we have found this to be effective. And as well, we must build networks with our media partners. Our training in investigative journalism is beginning to show effects in Jamaica in terms of some of the reports coming out in our newspapers. And so this is the how to achieve the what. But a cursory recall of those will easily lead you to see what the main challenge is. The main challenge, of course, is sustainability. How do you make sure that these are sustained over a period of time so that we don't get citizen assertiveness now and then and not sustained in the way that it ought to be? And to have sustainability, the major need of our civil society bodies and other citizens groups is, of course, funding. And that is one of the areas we have to pay much more attention to. We need to make certain that our funding is more secure from international development partners, but more so from our, international, our internal uh, allies and friends in the business sector and amongst the people themselves. The difficulty here, of course, is that so many are now struggling, literally, on the unprecedented hardships to make two ends meet. Even our churches are suffering from low levels of collection as a result of the hardship that people are facing. So this is the challenge, how to make our funding and our resource base more secure, more sustained and more adequate so that we can do the things necessary to ensure that levels of democracy are strengthened and on the basis of strengthening democratic institutions and practices, the level of trust in those institutions gradually returns and the turn to military and authoritarian rule is reduced. I know that I have taken up too much of my time, Madam Chairman, and before you, uh, as it were, hit the gavel, I think those are the few words I'd say by way of introduction, and I hope it, it would be enough to stimulate the questions and comments later Most on. Most definitely. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, what Professor Monroe has done for us this evening is really to lay out in a very compelling way, the problems, very jarring charts that we're looking at there, but not only to lay out the problems of which some of us are already very familiar, but he has also given us a very good idea as to how we're gonna have to chart a way forward. Underlying all of that is citizen engagement. And this is one of the reasons why we are here this evening. Um, some people don't believe in chat, but this is where action begins. So I wanna thank you for that, Prof. I'm going to ask those who have questions to let them know that you can begin to drop them in the chat. We'll be making note of that. And now I'm just going to welcome Professor Rosalia Hamilton. She is the CEO of the Lasco Chin Foundation since June of 2018 and was the vice president of the University of Technology. Rosie has established and led the Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Alliance, as well as a founder of the Institute of Law and Economics. She has worked as a consultant and public educator on trade, governance, social, economic areas, taught at the graduate and the undergraduate levels, and has served a few of our prime ministers, not the least of which was our first female prime minister as chief advisor. Rosie is currently a board director for the Lasco Manufacturing Limited and the National Integrity Action and the chair of the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance. We welcome Rosie now to share with us her thoughts on Restoring Trust in Democracy, the U.S. and the Jamaican Experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, thanks, Prof, for your um, very comprehensive overview there. Let me say this, it's an interesting time because I know that we are here to have a conversation. This is not a lecture. <laughs> um, I'm just going to highlight a few things I tried to do in the articles. And, and I was really compelled to write when I what observe what was happening in the US, um, this, this, this period we're in, and having reflected on our own reality, I just felt it is time for really fundamental changes. In, in thinking of, in that first article, we are talked about the lessons in democracy. Um, some of us may not even be aware, there are like 550 types of democracy. I mean, when I saw that for the first time, I said, wow, yeah. different types, right? And there are different conceptions of democracy. Um, you know, some people focus on like the rights, 
you know, those are important rights. But at the core of the concept is this idea of active participation of people in, in a government in which they, they reign supreme. And I think that's the concept that I want us to focus on because it's there that the problem of trust um, okay. lies. Yeah. Um, Although I did the lessons and people thought perhaps the lessons were just for us, you know, from America, there are lessons we can teach America. Um, and in my conversation with colleagues, someone yeah. pointed out and reminded me, and I certainly agree, that the Electoral Commission of Jamaica is something that we can teach. We've come out of very tribal politics those days. Some of us can remember the days where, you know, everything shut down on election day. Um, but, you know, we've had a process of the Electoral Commission that has brought some sanity to the electoral process. And, and I think also the selection of judges on the CCG, I talked about the partisan nature, nature of the judiciary that we see in the US. Um, you know, the, the world can learn. And in fact, I've seen articles where people are saying, yes, what we did in terms of the appointment of judges in the Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission is something that, you know, we can lend to the world. So, but importantly, I thought the lesson of the central control of the, um, the, 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 the central importance of the um, effectiveness of legislative oversight on the executive, I think was, is key. And so the two articles I did, part one and part two, I was grappling with the issues of how to ensure that the oversight that is implied in our constitution, section 69, subsection two, which is very clear about the role of parliament in relation to cabinet decisions and direction uh, and, and the control of government. It speaks about parliament's collective responsibility for cabinet's decisions. And so it, it begs the question, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> you know, what, 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 what does it mean? And so we've had a lot of accountability mechanisms put in place and we've ramped them up over the last few weeks, uh, months, years, um, with respect to, uh, we're now talking about $7 billion or their own. Jeanette has been tracking the, the numbers and quite a bit that we're spending on oversight uh, mechanisms in terms of public sector oversight. But, but I think the question of how the, the parliamentary oversight of the ultimate decisions that are made at the level of the prime minister and the cabinet ought not to just be about the corruption or the abuse of power, but also importantly, equity and fairness. So it's, it's, it's ensuring that we have decisions that are in the interest of the people that we need this kind of oversight. And we need our representatives in parliament to ensure that that takes place, that our views are represented. And so there was a lot, there was discussions about the parliamentary commissions, committees, and I suggested that the issue goes beyond the, co the committees and the opposition chairmanship of the committees and speaks very specifically to the extent to which our, our representatives in parliament can investigate the actions of the executive and the public administration and bring a kind of bipartisan vote um, in the public's interest um, that is, can be done and, and in corrective actions taken independent of cabinet. It kind of boils down to that way of thinking around this. And in the last piece in part two, I was seized of the Auditor General's report. I was tabled in parliament just last week, last, last week. And she was questioning the management of the Constituency Development Fund. And so it, it, it raises that question. Can, will we have a CDF, uh, the Constituency Development Fund parliamentary committee investigating, leading to a bipartisan vote that ultimately can reduce the risk of exploitation, nepotism, and misuse of funds. These are the words of the Auditor General, independent of cabinet. So, so, so that's the issue. Now, there are many institutional limitations. We understand this is not something that's gonna happen over, overnight. The whole system was shaped um, the whole governance arrangement was shaped and built around a time where it was a handful running the country and there was never a view that the majority of us could have a say, ought to have a say, or was even sensible enough to have a say. Um, that's where we're coming from. And we have not changed the fundamental structure of the system. And so you still have um, legacies of that whole arrangement that are difficult to change. 
the dominance of the executive in parliament is something that we see that we've inherited. We have the prime minister feral power, awesome centralization of power in the hands of the prime minister that we are clear about. We understand that that's a very important power because ministers want to be in the cabinet and so they follow the party line. And so if we think about the way in which the system is set up, I, I was encouraged by the, the writings of CLR James because CLR talks about the extent to which what happens in government ought to be um, replicated in the parties. And so you have par party structures that are also part of the difficulties that one has to change. And so I, he pointed to the, the divorce between the party as government and party as a people and suggesting that there that we have to think about our party structures differently. And then the final point I want to make is this, and that's where Trevor ended as well, that it all boils down to what do we do as the people of Jamaica? How do we protect and ultimately restore our democracy? The popular political culture must change. You know, it's not just, I just study things still and we just accept it. We have to strengthen citizen engagement. We have to see ourselves as owners. We own Jamaica, we own the Caribbean, we own the countries we inhabit. We are not squatters, we are not tenants, you know, and we have to act as if we're owners. And so I think that if we're going to restore trust in democracy, we must deal with the representative and participatory institutions of democracy. They must work to yield the outcomes that are ultimately in the interest of the people. We must make our, um, the, the oversight work as to the, our representation, um, our representatives in parliament, and we need actually to see citizen activism. In fact, I must say before this forum, I, was, I spent a few minutes with the Forest Hill Citizen Association as they deliberated around an issue. And it was a good example of independent organized citizens um, engagement, which is what CLR James talked about. He sees this as the last hill for us to climb. And he says it's the hardest. It's hard because of mental slavery, you know, divide and rule. You know, we major in the minor, um, you know, licky licky politics, all of that makes it very difficult for us to do what we need to do. But I think the time is now. And I hope that we'll heal the promises that he suggests that when we climb there, we'll get to a height that we'll um, never fall from. <laughs> What can I say? We hope that we can really um, achieve the outcomes we want. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good nutshell. And as I'd said before, we really hope that folks that had an opportunity to really take a look at the information that Rosie had been sharing so that we could really jump now into the discussion into some more of the media how. I am very big on the whole citizen engagement aspect of it. They say power concedes nothing without a demand. And so whatever changes are going to come, it's only reasonable that it's going to come from us and that it's going to start with these kinds of discussions. So I would actually start off, Rosie and Trevor, with the question that has been on my own heart for a little while. Um, for the last year, JAMP has been really focusing on trying to understand the parliament better and to demystify it for others. And in the process of doing that, um, one of the things I think would go a long way to shifting the whole challenge of trust is um, the entry points to citizen engagement in the space that makes decisions for us. There are different um, accountability mechanisms in the parliament. And one of them is the question time. I have a lot of questions sometimes as a citizen on some of the things happening in government and governance. And the whole idea of a representative is that he or she is supposed to be representing my thoughts and my concerns um, to the 63 elected officials and then to come back at us with an answer. So one of the things I'd really love to see coming out of this discussion on the how is how can we widen that entry point, that space to citizens being able to let their voices be heard more in that space. We have expertise out here we want to share. We have questions out here we want to ask. Are there any thoughts? And this is not limited to just um, Professor Monroe or Hamilton. If there's anybody else who would also like to jump in. But this is one of the questions that I have about improving trust and building a more robust democracy by including us in a more direct way than is allowed right now. Yeah, 
yeah, you know, as, as people think about this, um, I, I want to just reflect on the fact that, you know, opportunities for a referendum is a very important tool that we can use. Other parts of the Caribbean have been doing this. This is something that we have in Jamaica not experienced since independence. And that's just certainly something that, you know, we should contemplate. Trevor, you're on mute. I was saying I just saw two hands going up, so I will, I will pass for those persons who have a comment or question. Okay. Uh, my question is to Trevor. My name is Janet Silvera, Trevor. I don't know if you're hearing me. Yeah, I'm Are you hearing me? Hearing you loud and clear, Janet. Okay, fantastic. The fact that you have been instrumental in getting journalists in Jamaica to get training in investigative journalism, and with the fact that the environment is now a big issue, are there any plans for you to strengthen that area for journalists in this country? One. Two. Are you concerned about Mark Golding's expression of who he wants to be first VP, first, um, I mean, Gensec and chairman of the party of the People's National Party. Do you believe that is how one restores that trust in democracy? On the first issue that you raised, Jan, the question of the journalists and the media. It's clear and clear to me that as the democratic deficit, as let's call it that, uh, continues not only here in Jamaica, but elsewhere, part of the challenge is for the media itself to rebuild levels of trust. Because in most uh, countries, the media itself is, part of, is seen by too many as part of the problem. And therefore, one of the responsibilities of uh, media owners and investigative journalists is to so conduct themselves as to ensure that the people begin to see that they are, so to speak, developmental journalists on the side of the people. In that regard, we believe that it would be very important to encourage more of the journalists to get an understanding of the issue of environmental rights and, of course, connected to that, the matter of climate change. We would love to have plans, but here again, the training seminars that we have put on in the past in conjunction with the Media Institute of the Caribbean, which is based in Trinidad, which has now established the Citizen Investigative Journal, uh, Media Investigative Journalist website. Um, it requires a level of funding that we would not immediately have. And to that extent, it's one of the things that we would uh, wish to immediately engage, since I don't believe enough of us have a full understanding that what might seem to be a developmental gain for the next five years, employment of 100 people, attractive as it is in a context of the economic downturn, is going to be disastrous as we are experiencing if we do that development in the wrong place in terms of environmental uh, requirements. And by the way, since we're on it, I looked at the petition on the Office of the Prime Minister's website earlier today, and I see where 4,000 plus signatures had signed persons that signed up by maybe 11 o'clock. It needs to get to 15,000 in order to compel the government to make a specific and definitive answer, even though that itself won't guarantee the outcomes that we would wish. It didn't guarantee to the cockpit country where we actually got the 36,000 signatures, but the government is still having to be challenged in the courts in order to ensure that the cockpit country and importance of it to the environment is not uh, offended. In relation to the People's National Party, oh, my main interest, of course, like most of us, I think, who are engaged in this discussion, is to ensure that the 35, the 40 percent of citizens who uh, vote and who support that party are able, along with the rest of us, who many of whom did not vote, 62 percent of Jamaicans didn't vote in the last election. The government has 21 percent support of the electorate, the opposition 16 percent. We need to ensure that there's a robust opposition and 
frankly speaking, it's hard to see from outside without knowing much of the internal of what's going on in there. It's hard to make a prescription or a comment on that uh, without more information. But what I can say is we do need a robust opposition speaking on behalf of the people. We're not seeing that. In fact, regression is taking place in terms of parliamentary oversight, as Rosie has pointed out. And only this morning I learned that, indeed, the percentage of opposition persons represented in the committees is going to be is being reduced, not just the chairmanships uh, being changed, but the percentage mm -hmm. reduced. And also the determination of the agenda is going to be subject in each committee to the vote of the majority, which of course will be overwhelmingly governmental. So I'd need to know more, um, Janet, about the internal dynamics of the PNP to answer that second question more satisfactorily. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Janet. Vanos, I think your hand is up. You may go yes. ahead. Yeah. Um, yes, Janet, thanks for recognizing my hand. Thanks, Trevor and Rosalie, for the, uh, the nice summary presentations that you've done. Um, I could see you all have done a lot of research to think through these issues. Trevor, I want to begin with the, um, the place you just went, and that is to recognize that you need a robust opposition. And I would add to that, that you really also need a robust backbench for the, from the government side. Mm -hmm. That is to say, when all is said and done, the parliament that we've designed in Jamaica and in the rest of the Caribbean is not designed to facilitate democracy. For one thing, it's too small. If you think about the share of the, uh, the government members who are in the cabinet and the share who aspire to be in the cabinet, you have almost nobody else left who are in the parliament dedicated to the business of representing the views of their constituents. So if you take the, the, the totality of the opposition and those few who are minded to be uh, uh, watchdogs over the government, what you would find is that that totality is, if, you, if government was to turn over uh, the, the, the mandate of oversight to them, effectively what it would be doing, the governing party would be doing is turning over the government to the opposition. For that not to happen, the parliament has to be enlarged and you have to have enough members in the, uh, in the house who do not plan to be and do not expect to be in the, uh, in the, in the cabinet and therefore uh, about the business of forming coalitions in the parliament to oversee uh, and check the actions of the of the cabinet. So that's one important thing I think we ought to think about across the region. Okay. It's a little bit presumptuous to say restoring trust in democracy, when in a way we've never had trust in democracy in any serious way across the region, because we've always really never run democratic systems, or at least on the basis I just mentioned there where the parliament represents a place where people can practice their, their democracy. The second point I want to make is that the political parties themselves, uh, what prompted CLR James's work was his fight in the PNM here in Trinidad and Tobago with Eric Williams to make the PNM a place where the members of the party could practice democracy, could practice the oversight of the leadership of the parties and to make the parties places, platforms in which, uh, from which they could engage in a conversation about where the country is going with members of the opposite parties. Uh, we, CLI never got that done. And to this day, we've never really built political parties anywhere in the region, including in Jamaica, that represent platforms in which people could practice the oversight of the executive of the parties. And as a consequence, there is really no fundamental basis on which people could build the trust through practice. 
And then the last point I want to make, I mean, there are many issues we can raise on, the, on this, this wonderful topic. But the last point I want to make is that the education system we've built across the region is a complete disaster when it comes to preparing citizens for the responsibility to govern the country. We are the owners of the country and the education system is completely lacking in its design with respect to both matters of fair and adequate education for all our citizens, equal quality across the board and so on, those kinds of issues, uh, relevance, and especially the matter of preparing citizens for the escape from mental slavery required to govern the government. And I think I would like to hear both of you comment on those three kinds of issues, which we have failed in my view to address throughout the history of the Caribbean from the founding years, post and immediately before and post independence to today. So I don't see a basis on it on which we could build any trust. Not until we do reforms to achieve that kind of, that set of changes. Can I, can I quickly jump in on that? Uh, Please do, Prof. Yeah, Vanas, you have raised some really crucial Good points. Point. Mm -hmm. To the extent that, in fact, what you just said in relation to the in ineffectiveness of backbenchers is a point that became much more recognized by the Jamaican policymakers after 30 years of independence in the 1990s. So much so that they took the first step and it's for us to finish the, the process that both sides agreed in a 1995 parliamentary joint select committee on constitutional reform, that there should be an, a constitutional limit on the number of ministers that any government could have drawn from uh, the parliament. Now, this wouldn't meet what you and I would wish, no, all of us, but what it would do is limit the extent to which in any administration, a backbencher could believe that he has an opportunity to become a minister if the numbers were limited to 12, 13, 14, and you have a, you have a parliamentary majority of 40 odd as we do now. Then more would see that their name could be made by being genuine representatives of the people rather than being aspirants to the cabinet and therefore fearful of alienating uh, the prime minister. So that's one proposal that's on the table, but because of a lack of citizen awareness, lack of engagement, it remains on the table and probably gathering dust in, in file 13. Mm -hmm. Another quick observation in relation to citizen education. Interestingly, both manifestos of the Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party in the 2020 election speak of the need for educate, civic education at the secondary school level. You've heard nothing about it from either side since, and so few of us bother to read those manifestos because we don't think they make any sense that they're just paper without any implementing um, record, mm -hmm. which is for us to hold them to account for these commitments made in the public domain. Our experience in an IA of education at the secondary school level particularly the establishment of integrity clubs, which I believe is now being done in Trinidad as well by our counterparts to teach the youngsters uh, engagement in, in, in citizen activism and honesty. And also the, the docudrama that we did on the life of Marcus Garvey is something that attracted much attention amongst the youngsters and indicates the potential and the demand for more of the kind of education of which you speak, which is not really happening now. It's one of the areas that we uh, who want to see more citizen engagement need to put on the table in our respective organizations. Thank you, Prof. I just want to... Thank you, Vanas. Thank you, Prof. I just want to share with you just a couple of the comments. There's been a lot of um, feedback on Vanas's comments. Um, Rosemary is saying really we ought to start with the fundamentals of really being clear about what is a democracy and something that just the folks in the street can understand starting there, just going down to the rudimentaries. Um, we also have Sylvester saying that political parties in Jamaica have only semblances of democracy, but it has never been true. And I think this is just reinforcing um, what Vanas is saying. Uh, we have skirted with democracy since 1972 to 1978, but since then, apart from voting government in and out of power, we have never 
at government by the people and for the people. And again, Sylvester, that's really what I was hinting at when I say we need to find the entry points for more participatory and more direct democracy where our voice can be better heard. And there are models of that around. It's just for us to figure out how we're going to get it done. Now I see two more hands. We are at 601. We really want to remain really true to our commitment to the hour. So what we did um, two weeks ago when we started the series is to really say to folks, come six o'clock, we understand if you have to go. We ask you just to leave any comments if you must go here at six, but we allow the presenters and for those who still have some questions and comments to remain. We said 15 minutes the last time, but the, the discussion ran a little bit longer to half an hour. So we're pausing here because we also have some polls that we want to put up before folks do leave on the mark of six. These are questions really just to guide us with our next steps. I saw a comment from Anthony. Anthony was not a big fan. Um, it almost sounds as if Anthony's comments are going back to the boys. This is just a talk shop. But while the polls come up and I just ask for about a few minutes for you to make a selection from this quick survey. Um, who you have represented here in the Institute of Law and Economics, National Integrity Action and JAMP are really advocacy groups that are shifting their programs based on what comes out of a number of these conversations. Um, JAMP has a literal tool that we're putting out there to engage citizens, to educate citizens, and to try and deal with accountability um, upfront. So I, I just want to encourage folks to, to know that this is really not a talk shop. The responses from this, the comments coming in, the ideas about where we need to take the next steps are really going to be mined and farmed by these um, organizations. And our programs evolve to move in the direction of where you are saying we need to go in order for the next steps to really define this democracy and to get it to work for us better than it is now. So I think there is a current um, poll on your screen. Just a couple of seconds, ask you all just to vote on that for us before we allow those who have to leave to, to do so. And those who would like to stay on for a few more minutes because I see some more hands and comments to also do that. Um, I think we can multitask and that might actually be a good thing. So while we're polling, I'm going to just invite Anthony, who I think I was trying to speak on behalf of, and I'm glad to see his hand. Anthony, you want to unmute and just share those thoughts with us, please? Yeah, good, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Evening, evening. Um, Ms. Ms. Jeanette, I just wanted to say to you personally, yes. I, I appreciate the work of JAMP, yeah? Um, but I have some issues because mm -hmm. I, I have been around a long time. Right? Yeah. And um, for example, I feel that this thing is, is almost back, is almost putting the, the, the cat before the horse. The horse? Okay. I, think, I think instead of hearing people present mm -hmm. um, these, because out of the hour, the, the presenters took up 50 minutes or about, right? I think what people, what, 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 uh, like, well, um, our agenda should be is to is to come to listen and not come to tell, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think they understand the issues. To be frank with you, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be. I'm not being being disrespectful. Believe me, I'm. I'm. I'm they speak of very important issues, but yeah. to me, they are they are missing the biggest, the bigger picture. Okay. Um, and the bigger picture is we do not have a common mission. For example, as a people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're talking from all kind of different perspectives, um, and 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 sometimes the perspectives are 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 so far apart. But we do we do not have any coordinating um, body. So I don't want to go into all of that. I just want to say, right, that I think that we are going about this the wrong way, okay. right? I think that our intelligentsia they are products of a of a system. Mm -hmm. Western system that has serious um, um, issues to question, but but we are not questioning them. Okay, I I I'm, I'm, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm saying some my problem. 
to be frank with you, Miss Carla, mm -hmm. please feel as if I, I am wasting my time when I come into a session like this. Okay. Because I've heard these things, I've heard the 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 the, 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 the statistics and the difference which is important. Mm -hmm. But it is only important if it is being applied mm -hmm. to to a context that is that is that is that is that is relevant for progress. And frankly, with all of what I've, I've heard, I, I agree that we need to, 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 to consider our democracy. Mm -hmm. Thing is, mm. for example, our, our intellectuals have a drawbridge mentality. A what mentality, Anthony, sorry? I, I'm saying a drawbridge, a drawbridge mentality. Tell me what's that, yeah. what I mean is, you cross a moat and then you draw up the bridge, and then you stay among yourselves and, and, and things, but you do not, you do not understand many, we, many, in many issues that the society has. The society has mm -hmm. it, a lot of people in our society. You, I, I just feel that 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 it is it is it, it is like a, it is I, I don't it is it's like an ego shop. It is like presenting mm -hmm. you know, saying yes, you are this and you are you are you are. You are that's what it comes across to me because I don't. It hasn't been effective in the fifty-eight years of independence. Mm -hmm. Not going to be effective because it doesn't deal with the real issues, and I, I will stop on that. Well, Anthony, I'm glad that you had placed your comments in the chat, and I'm really glad that you responded to my invitation to say it out loud because this is the reason why we're here. This kind of level of frankness, and this kind of level of openness. I, I, I'm gonna ask if anybody would like to respond, and if there's none, then I will go ahead. But is there anybody who would like to comment on what Anthony said before I say anything? Yeah, if, you, if you allow me as a person coming from the rest of the Caribbean and watching, sure, I would say that I want to encourage Anthony to be a little more uh, open-minded and, and to facilitate the discussions and the contributions by people like Professor Monroe and Professor Hamilton. Uh, the typical citizen is generally quite cynical. They want everything to be... Uh, done now, they're impatient with scholarship, they're impatient with dialogue, mm. and they're just generally angry. We can't fix the Caribbean, we can't fix Jamaica that way. If Anthony has a set of views about what the problem is, he needs to come to the session, not give up on the session, come to the session and lay them out. Petition Jeanette and Rosalie and Trevor, for your opportunity to lay out what you think are the issues, because I think it is a little bit disingenuous to, to dismiss in the way you are what Hamilton and Monroe are really saying. And I say that as a legitimate Jamaican who lives in the rest of the Caribbean. Thank you, um, Vanos. If there isn't anyone else, I, I really just I want to say to... One, one thing, if I may, Jeanette, and that's sure. is... Anthony ended by saying not we're not dealing with the real issues. If if he could just tell us a couple of them that he felt maybe next time or if there's not enough time, no, what are the real issues that we should be dealing with? All right, can I can I come all right? For example, I I I'll, I'll point it out this way. And 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 my position is um as as simple as this. When I was growing up, right? Um, I heard the Rastaman talk about love, healthy food, healthy eating, respect for the environment, um, reasoning with one another, right? These are, these are activities that build trust, which is what you're talking about. These are the activities that enhance trust. I am saying trust is not enhanced by standing up on a stage and showing how um, um, knowledgeable a person is or what research has been done. Trust is much more basic than that. It is interacting with individuals. It is interacting at a much more grassroots level, right? And being just as, as the, the speaker before saying, he's saying that I'm not being open. Well, that's his choice, choice of words, right? 
maybe it is maybe I'm, I, what I am saying is it needs to be more open because I don't think the, the scholarship is open to natural, simple reasoning. And I've given you some examples of the things that build trust. I am putting it to you that there's no way you can show me that trust is going to be built by sharing the, 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 the by just sharing research work. Trust is built by when people act out the beliefs that they claim or the, 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 the positions that they claim. That's how trust is built. Thank you, Anthony. My contribution to this is really just to say as briefly as I can, um, the work, you started out by saying that you do appreciate the work, for instance, that you know I and the board of JAMP are doing. Uh, JAMP is a one-year-old organization, and it's really and truly coming out of conversations like this that I have a better understanding as to how we can evolve to fit the need. But JAMP was born, Anthony, out of research. I came into advocacy with persons like Trevor Monroe, Rosalie Hamilton, teaching me how to do what we call evidence-based advocacy, which is outside of just talk, we come to government having looked at an issue, have the facts and come with some solutions. Um, so JAMP stands on two major research products that were done in 2016. And at the time when we did the research, we didn't know what it would evolve into, but it is by sharing the findings of those two pieces of research that it evolved slowly but surely over four years into a tool that we have now provided to both citizens here and in the diaspora to engage more directly with um, the elected officials about the concerns on corruption and accountability. Still young, but it is sessions like these that I believe is gonna help it to evolve. So I understand what you're saying. I don't have the answers for every demographic. I can only um, use the space that spaces like these that I was afforded in 2013 when I came in and all I could say to persons like Professor Monroe, Carol Nancy, Susan Goff, Carolyn Gomes is, how can I help? And it is just coming in through the door and saying that, that it evolved, as I said, into research and then it evolved into an organization. And I really believe in another year, we will be saying something different here as it relates to the impact on the ground that JAM can have. So that's my personal response to you. I respect academia, I respect research, I respect conversation. And we really are committing, Anthony, to take these discussions somewhere beyond just the conversation here. And that's the best answer that I can give you and hope that you will come back to the third in the series. Can I, can I just say, can I yeah. just say one thing more? Um, I, I totally respect the, 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 the evidential-based research. Okay. I totally respect that, right? So okay. I don't dismiss my argument with that, with that, in, that in, in that way, right? Okay. I totally respect research. But what I am saying is mm -hmm. research must make sense. In other words, there mm -hmm. is, is it, it, it must be to achieve something. It must be applied to something, right? And, 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 and I'm saying I recognize the work that you have done because I've heard about it recently and I, mm -hmm. I see you on Cliff Hughes and I, and I think that it is really important. I am not dismissing anybody or any research. I mm -hmm. am saying that there needs to be balance and there is insufficient balance because we are so lost in, 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 in being intellectuals, in my opinion, that we mm -hmm simple things that build trust. That is my point. That is one of my points. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it at that, Anthony, by yes. saying, I'm going to leave it at that by saying, come back, help us to be the balance. I think it is persons like yourself who think the way you do have a better handle on some of the things we don't have a better handle on that must keep coming into the space to create the balance because I have a different perspective. I have a different thing to offer. So do you keep coming back in and helping us to establish that balance. And as it relates to the work of Professor Monroe, I'm gonna just say it openly. I invite you to check out what NIA has been doing since 2011. And I don't think it has only been limited to just conversation. And then hopefully after you take a look at that, Anthony, we can have a conversation again about what are your views are 
on this particular matter. But I really think it's an organization that has translated talk into action. And we really just need the balance, like you said, but people like you staying here with us, help us to get it better the next time around. That's the best that I can say, but I really appreciate the honesty. You really have given me something to continue thinking and talking about, yeah? I think the polling is finished. I thank you all for contributing. Um, and as I said, this will help us to determine a better time, what are the different subjects and where we will go with what we have garnered from, from the challenges that have been enumerated today and some of the solutions. Now, for those who would like to stay a little bit longer, there are some more comments there in the room, some more messages that are coming in. Um, Trevor and Rosie are willing to stay until 6.30 to address those. So on that note, I want to thank you all for coming. We have had at least 50 plus persons with us this evening. I was told usually you only get 60% of who registered. This looked like about 80% to me. So I really want to thank you all for being here. And we will continue to keep you abreast on our next steps. And on that note, I'm just going to scroll down to see while I'm scrolling, if anybody wants to unmute and jump in, feel free. I just want to go and check and see which hands are still up. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind making a comment. Sure, Sylvester. Uh, for, um, I don't think we should overlook Anthony's um, position, but we should oh. also be mindful that uh, that's one opinion. So mm -hmm. if I had come on and, and spoke the direct opposite of Antonio's position as strongly as he did, then that could cre create a kind of conundrum if you're going to try to react to me that way. I think we, you should take into consideration um, mm -hmm. Antonio's position here. And as a group, you, you continue to look for this intersection between the people you're looking to represent like Anthony mm -hmm. because I'm sure there might be others like him out there with his opinion mm -hmm. um, and just recognize again that um, it might be a minority opinion and you know take it for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I really want to say though that I, I didn't hear anybody mentioned before is this business of economic opportunities okay because i think people will trust in their government regardless of what type it is when um, people feel that the 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 outcomes are favorable to their lives mm -hmm. and and that there is some sense of fairness and you know i think when we have a small pie and especially when the government pick winners and losers then there will always be a lot of dissatisfaction among mm -hmm. the populace yeah. because the truth is that the way that we have governed for the last 50, 100 years in most of these countries throughout the region is for the money, the, 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 the people with money, for mm -hmm. the, the, the upper class people and mm -hmm. the, 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 the poor, which is the, the large majority of people kind of get the crumbs that are left over. So until we really have more crumbs to keep us happy, yeah. uh, we're going to be dissatisfied with whatever kind of governance we yeah. are um, mm -hmm. that, that presides over us. So I, I think, and I hope that you guys will talk about economic opportunities because mm -hmm. if, if people have economic opportunities, a lot of satisfaction will follow that. Understood. Thank you, Sylvester. And I, I'm going to take, I see Carol's hand. But I'm really sorry if I didn't do justice to how I felt about Anthony's um, contribution. It really is worth a lot. And I am just going to allow some others to speak. But I just want to say, if I did leave you with the impression, Sylvester, that that was something I was bypassing lightly, not in the least. I'm challenged by some of what he has said, because it needs to translate in my mind as to how do we go forward the next time to ensure that that is taken into consideration. Don't have an answer. But what I am saying though, is that part of the answer is that there's room at the table for everybody. That is how it began for me. That is how it evolved for me. We want to keep Anthony here until we strike the kind of balance that he has said we need. 
So I just wanted to um, clarify that just in case it sounded as if there was anything dismissive at all about Anthony's contribution. Carol, could you unmute and go right ahead? And then Martha to follow, thanks. Oh, maybe I can help. Carol? I think you're still on mute, Carol. I see your hand. I don't know if you still want to you can hear me now. Yes, you are with us. Uh -huh. okay. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Um, a couple of thoughts. One, as I listened to Anthony, I thought of Walter Rodney and his approach to melding scholarship and his academic um, the, the academic work with. The, the reasoning work with the with the groundings work with the, okay. with the bringing it and translating translating it into a, a process of engaging with people um, and and conscientization um, in a very sort of in a way that that every people can identify with, can see themselves within, and can also co-create with a Walter, the, 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 the thinking about life and about futures. Um, so that that approach to scholarship is, and, and to ideas making and formation and thinking through where we're going um, as a people, nationally, regionally, globally, um, is something is you know is something for us to to think about what will be the engagement methods, um, especially in, in a pandemic world, um, that that transports the 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 scholarship, the evidence that has been gathered, the the research, etc., transports it out um, um, to the to the ground and to the people. So that's one, needing to think about how we're going to move these conversations um, outwards um, is one, one question for us to, to grapple with. The other thing I thought about as I listened to the presentations was the, 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 organi the principles around which we, and I heard Anthony saying, making, alluding to this as well, what, what what are the unifying principles that we have? Um, so Anthony made reference to to um, to Rastafari and to the the essence of Rastafari Rastafari teachings that represented a unifying idea, a unifying ideology, a unifying worldview um, that you then could have reasoning around. You can propagate you can get an agreement around. And although, although within Rastafari you have different hosts, different mansion, different dimensions, you still had some core principles. And so the question that came to my mind as I listened to Trevor and Rosalie is that we have this vacuum of philo phil philosophical underpinnings that the, the society is subscribing to development thinking that the society is, is being asked to subscribe to. Um, and in the absence of a set of unifying ideas, principles, ideologies, worldviews, development on thinking or understanding, you get the, you know, seven, as many different I pulling and pushing against each other because we, we don't have some basic agreements about what kind of development we're after, what, the, what, what it looks like, what it feels like, what the essence of, of it is, and what, what our role in it is as citizens vis-a-vis -vis the people who we select to manage affairs on our behalf. Um, and how, how can we bring ideology, ideas, principles, a set of, you know, an, an agreed set of thoughts about where we're going and how we're going to go? Um, how do we, how, it's almost as if we've become afraid 
to have that conversation. So we have the conversation about mechanics, about methodologies of organizing, etc. But but without a set of core things that that we are juxtaposing to the prevailing views about development. I'll leave it there. Um, Carol has left it there, but that was a meaningful mouthful. Is I, I did see Mirtha's hand, but if there is anyone who wanted to comment on what Carol says is missing in terms of the how do we find that unifying force, those unifying principles, then I would welcome you to comment before I ask Mirtha to share with us what her thoughts are. And Tariq, I'm also acknowledging that you are standing with Anthony and that you sympathize with his views. And so I'm realizing that this is really turning out to be um, a very, very um, instructive part of the conversation for us today. Is there anybody who wants to comment on what Carol said? Well, <clears throat> may I just make a comment since nobody is, and we're close to 6.30. <laughs> yeah, what Carol says is, is true. You need forms of work which allow you to reason, to listen, and to contribute on an equal basis. And I well remember being part of the reasoning that Walter had in various communities and uh, districts around the country, not least of all in Dunkirk in, in central Kingston. The challenge that we face, of course, is to carry out the reasonings at different levels. Um, the level of the university, the level of the media, the level of of the, the grassroots. And our experience in NIA is that the grassroots reasonings are very, very, very productive. The grassroots reasoning in the, in the communities with Youth Crime Watch, with Women's Research Outreach Center, with the various groups in the uh, communities around the country, those mm -hmm. are very important and have their place. And we need to do more of them to find out how we can do it in the context of a pandemic um, that doesn't seem to be going away and social distance and all, and all the other stuff. The other point, of course, the unifying, uh, the unifying philosophy, the equity, the absence of equity and the absence of uh, social justice is basically the underpinning that people are, uh, are rejecting in the democratic system, but the one that we have and the one that other countries have. And to that extent, that's our starting point. How do we uh, develop a philosophy around greater equity, equity mm. in opportunity, mm. equity in the justice system, equity in, in the other aspects of, of life, in the health services, etc., and um, give meaning to our national pledge, which in fact, you know, has a fairly strong philosophy that everybody recites, but we don't translate it adequately into our practical day-to-day -day work, into, you know, doing the stuff that would help to engage the authorities in a more meaningful way, like talk shows and writing letters and signing petitions, which have been demonstrated to produce results, marginal and minimal, but at least a start. So I agree with both observations. We need to find a way to do more effectively. Goes back to citizen engagement. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and uh, our last comment then, if Martha still has something that she would like to share with us, Martha, would you like to go ahead before we wrap? Um, yes, good evening. Um, first of all, it's almost impossible to have democracy in countries where the, the income disparity is so wide, where mm. a fraction of the, of, of the population owns the system. And mm. it, whenever I see this statistic about um, <clears throat> this great percentage of Jamaicans who are willing to go along with, with military uh, rule. Mm -hmm. It always makes me laugh because I realize that they have no idea. They, they, they have no idea what military rule means. That it, they, they don't understand that military rule is the last bastion of authoritarianism. And so you re that makes you realize how dangerous it is mm -hmm. when people are ignorant of what democracy really means. And I compare that, I see a parallel with the US where Americans were lulled for decades into this complacency that they were the greatest democracy in the world. 
even though it was an illusion of democracy, but they were so, they were so complacent that, you know, they used to think of, of um, dictatorships, you know, as what they, 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 uh, this parallel, they, they condescendingly called banana, banana republics. Okay. And now we're watching a dictatorship, a full-fledged assault on democracy taking place in what is supposed to be the greatest democracy in the world, oh, wow. quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the, so they were so blind to it that even the, the 70 million people who voted for Trump don't understand that, that what they're voting for is authoritarianism. So mm -hmm. we used to sit here and wonder, well, how can a Hitler really come to power? How could okay. a Stalin come to power? Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated watching okay. what is going on in the US because you see how it happens. You see how a demagogue co-ops the language of, of democracy in order to become the gatekeepers of authoritarianism. And so they exploit emotions through prejudice, they exploit prejudice and hatred and ignorance and arouse passions to the point where people don't even realize that they're devolving into authoritarianism and they go along with it <laughs> until it's too late. Yeah. And now the, the Americans are locked in a life and death struggle to salvage their democracy. And they've come to the brink and looked into the abyss and they are struggling to step back from the brink. And so I think that here in Jamaica, people should take a look at that to realize how precious democracy is. N not that we have it because, but you must, because you must know your rights, first of all, to have a democracy, and you must know your responsibilities. Of course, we have to come back to the problem of, of the, the income disparity. Very often, money buys justice. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you have this great income disparity where people cannot even get justice because justice is reserved for the for the you know the privileged few, there needs to be widespread education grassroots reasonings, as Professor Monroe was saying, to, 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 to enlighten people, to educate people about what democracy means, how precious it is, yeah. how you maintain it, how you preserve it, what are the mechanisms to make the democracy work. work. Because mm -hmm. the people who are voting for the military rule, the little democracy that we do have, mm -hmm. instead of trying to go forward and get more, they're, they want to step back, go backward, right? So I think that there is a great look at what is happening in the US and take a lesson from that because there is a lot of education to be, to, to be done. Absolutely. Well said, Martha. Yes, really well said. Yes, I'm basically Rosie going to just offer closing statements to both you and Professor Monroe, but really want to thank Martha for that. I think that was a really good... Um, summation so Rosie. Just in a sec, just yes and then Trevor on. afterwards and then we can close um I, I think part of the challenge we have you know coming out of this whole drama with COVID and what has happened was really how do we continue this engagement um and 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 torn between public education on the one hand where there's still a lot we need to learn none of us um I, I haven't stopped learning every article I write I, I learn um, so I'm educating myself as we go. And on the other hand, facilitate a forum for dialogue where all views contend. Mm -hmm. And so we welcome all the different ideas and we're not all- I cannot hear you. We're not all, we're not all going to agree on everything, but we want a forum in which we can hear and we can listen. I, I actually made, made an, important, I an important point in one of the articles about on the one hand, not dismissing the 
academics have been in trust. And, and let me say, Anthony, I'm not saying you're saying that. I, I take your point and I hear your point. But others do. Other people dismiss academics for not being in touch and so on. On the other hand, we don't listen to those who don't have degrees and don't need a professor. We ignore them because we think they have nothing valuable to say. And neither perspective gets us where we need to go. I want to make this point that while we're having this discussion and while we're disagreeing and, and, and agreeing and so on, the status quo continues. The gap between the wealthy and, the, and those who are not is widening. All the data we've seen so far across the world is suggesting that things are getting worse. And so while we do need a unifying principle that will help, but if we can't even unify enough around all the things, I think an important message coming out of this must be the need for action, civic action. Mm -hmm. I spent prior over the last few years talking to about 5,000 people across Jamaica. I was able to do it because I had a project and we went community by community and we sat down and listened to young people speaking. Actually, some of them, Martha, who told me openly that um, they are among those who feel that they must mash up the system and they want a strong rule and so on because they're angry. And so we have to find a way to how do, how do we re-energize that energy, that pen, pent up anger that's there, that is real in our society. And part of that we think is about education. Mm -hmm. um, as we motivate action, which I hope we can coming out of this conversation, that we all find ways in our communities, in our respective spaces to act, to change the status quo. The Institute of Law and Economics is trying to do that. We're part of this dialogue with JAMP and um, Naya um, as we rethink how we have to collaborate more and engage these kinds of conversations. So I want to just say that at the end that I, I think it's important that we grasp the challenge we have in trying to be part of a process of public education on the one hand, and also facilitating dialogue and dialogue where all views will contend. And sometimes we talk above persons or below persons, but there's no easy middle ground to communicate. And we have to just find a way in this dialogue to do that. Can I just Thank say you. one word on what Rosalia said about the youth who are angry? I understand that they're angry but military rule is not the solution. People, people who cannot even respect a COVID curfew are asking for military rule. Now, the, the thing is that the, the, the reason why the education is so important is that when people are angry, they go for extreme solutions. That is what is happening in the US right now. Mm -hmm. they, right. they become vulnerable to demagogues. So it is crucial to educate the youth, I understand that they're angry. I understand there's a lot of injustice in this society, right. but military rule is not <laughs> the solution. Yeah, so understood. It um, really is an, it, go ahead, Prof. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, agree with the one million percent because the kind of situation that we have described is one that's ready-made for demagogues to do what Trump is doing and to do what is being done in so many other countries. The, 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 to the, US, the, US, the US is the most public example, but it's happening to some extent in the United Kingdom, it's happening throughout Europe, it's happening in other countries where because the situation is so bad for the majority, particularly youth and women, they are vulnerable to demagogues who say, look, the problem is not that the institutions aren't functioning as well as they ought to, the problem is the institutions themselves. Let's get rid of election. Let's get, out, get rid of the uh, free press. Let's get rid of the, uh, these intellectuals because they really are not worth, uh, worth uh, listening to. So that's the vulnerability. And therefore, it does require finding the forms of reasoning uh, which can inoculate youngsters against that. I see the angry youth, but I also see the youth in the National Youth Council. I see the youth in the integrity action movements on the university campuses, the integrity club, the whole set of young people who are at the same time open to better understanding of how the system is working. How can it be made to function in a manner that's beneficial to the majority? And those are the folks we need to get to. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the hundreds of town hall meetings and the forums in the communities and other stuff 
which NIA has been doing and which others have been doing, or which produce some outcomes that have been beneficial are not any more possible in the current situation. And we need to find the forms. But the education to make people know yeah. that it's jumping from the frying pan into the fire, you feel that the authority and ruler, the one who wants to do good but forget the rules, is the one you need, whether military or otherwise, to make people understand that's the frying pan into the fire. What we need to do is make the institution more democratic, more representative, empower you to get your views heard and actions taken that will bring about that result. So I agree 100% with Myrtle. I agree with what Rosie says as well. And we need to find more action orientation based on the need to get rid of the issues that are encouraging people to turn towards authoritarian rule. And it's a very dangerous situation in our country as well as more widely. Thank you, Prof. Well, on that note, I'm sure each and every one of us have come away from this conversation with different takeaways. I see Martha giving that a thumbs up. Thanks, Martha. But at the end of it all, I think we can be sure of what is required here is greater involvement of citizens and more civic education. I, for one, am really deeply appreciative of the intervention of Anthony, Vanos, uh, Martha. I see Rosie, Sylvester, Tariq, and others in the comment section. We are going to harvest all of the comments. This was really not just a talk shop. I really appreciate the challenge that um, Anthony, Anthony is not a new challenge. Ever since I've started in advocacy, I have struggled to really figure out for my own self coming into the ring, how to reach um, the folks that are not necessarily immediately in the space that I operate in. I still don't have the answer. So I start with the folks who are in the sphere where I am. And when we have interventions like this, we reach out to you so that we can keep you in the circle and in the midst to help us to create and to strike that balance that we clearly haven't struck as yet, but really desirous of doing and will not get far if we do not figure out how. So I really wanna thank you all for your contribution tonight. We're gonna to be reaching back out to you with the results from the polls, as well as some comments on some of the things that were said in the chat, but we didn't get a chance to respond to. And to say that in another two weeks, depending on what your answers were, for what you would like to see us discuss next, I have my own biases, <laughs> but we will, we will let you know what our next um, intervention will be. And hopefully Trevor, Rosie, having had some time to think about it, talk about it, come back to the discussion, taking some more media answers to some of the issues that were raised tonight, because I maintain this is not a talk shop and none of the organizations represented here only talk. So I really wanna thank you very much for your time that you've invested and wish you all a very, very, very good night until we get a chance to do this again. Yeah. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette, very much appreciated and all those Thank who you. attended as well. Thank you all. Thank you, bye-bye.